on the track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. So, what do we have in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hennis, we have the second part of our interview with Daniel Perez, the famous Bigfoot expert. And we have a particularly scary wasp. And for the rest of it, and there will be some more of it, you're just going to have to wait and see. I really like the old credits. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's John Downs. I'm the director of an organisation called the Centre for Fortune Zoology. And welcome to another episode of On the Track. For those of you not in the know, every Saturday afternoon for about half an hour and every Wednesday evening at a, for about half that, we bring you a general mishmash. I used to call it a potpourri or even a mélange, but that's all a bit pretentious because talking in French when you're not French just in order to impress people is pretentious. So, moi, pretentious? No. And so I now call it a general mishmash, which is something I pinched from one of Douglas Adams' books and I can't remember which one. A general mishmash of hard science, weird shit, and surreality. What's surreality? I think we should probably ask Archibald. Surreality is what happens when Dad or maybe Uncle Richard start doing stupid things that don't make any sense and embarrass me in front of the cats. Regular viewers of the show will know that for the last couple of months I've been including a piece about how my brother who is a clergyman living and working in Germany, has been running a project in order to send things called Kelly's Kettles to Ukraine. These are kettles which can cook and heat without an external power source, just with a handful of twigs or dry leaves or pine cones. Well, today I had this message from him. Hi Jonathan, I hope you are okay. Good news, we raised enough for 60 Kelly Kettles in the end which have now arrived safely in Romania. They will be taken to Kiev next weekend. We want to raise funds to send more but we want to wait until we receive feedback first. Could you help us by taking down any advertising you have for the Kettles for the time being? We do not want to accumulate more funds just yet. Please feel free to share the above with your readers and thank all who have supported the project so far. Well, I want to say a big thank you to you all from me. I'm very, very proud to know that members of the extended CFZ family have been so generous with their time, their prayers and their money. Thank you very much, and I think it's very likely that I'll be back here talking about Kelly Kettles very soon. Back at the beginning of the winter, when we were going to hospital for one of my regular visits about my damaged feet, Graham and I saw this on the front gate of the CFZ, and 
because I'm a bit shaky at the moment, I got Graham to film it and I wonder if you can guess what this is. It's something that I haven't seen anywhere near the CFZ for many, many years. As I believe I've told you before, my family first moved to this cottage in Woolsey, a little village in North Devon, in the summer of 1971. And back in the summer of 1971, my mother went to the Travelling Library, which came to the village and still comes to the village once a week. And she was looking for books for the whole family and she got me, amongst other things, a book called Living with Butterflies by L. Hugh Newman and this has been one of my favourite books ever since. And I was so impressed by reading about how Hugh Newman's father was the man who started up Britain's first butterfly farm and how L. Hugh Newman had continued with the project that I decided in all my 11 year old enthusiasm and glee that I was going to start up a butterfly farm. And so as I had done back when I was in Hong Kong I went looking for caterpillars and most of the caterpillars that I found were this Pyrrhus brassica it is the caterpillar of this, the large white butterfly, one of the creatures which is known all around the world as the cabbage white. Guess why? One, it eats cabbages and members of the cabbage family, and two, it's white. I'd seen what I thought were cabbage whites in Hong Kong only a year or so before. But it wasn't until I read Hugh Newman's book and perused in some depth a collection of Taifu tea cards that my best mate, David, who lived next door, had given me. John, on behalf of young people everywhere, I want to ask, what the hell is a Taifu tea bag, tea card, tea doodle? Well, Louis, in the days before the internet came along and ruined everything, people actually used to go to shops. And when they went to shops, there were little shops called grocers and you used to go into a grocery in order to buy supplies. Things that these days you might go into a supermarket for, but it was in a much smaller and more friendly atmosphere. And there were only several, a few types of tea on sale. And each of them tried to make their product more exciting to the consumer by appealing to the young sons and daughters of the consumer. And so each time you bought a packet of tea, it had a little card inside it, a collectible card, a bit like, Louis, do they still have bubblegum cards? I don't know what's that. Okay, he doesn't know what a bubblegum card is either. If they had these collectible cards, I'm not even going to bother to ask him if they had cigarette cards in his day, because I know the answer to that one. And you would collect them all and try and swap. That means exchange for you born before 1980. Exchange your cards that you had surplus with your friends who had surplus other cards in the schoolyard. And one of these, done by, I think, Typhu, was a collection of butterflies of the British Isles. And David had collected most of them, but as he knew I was fascinated with butterflies, he gave them to me. But I found out there's not just one species of cabbage white in Britain, there are actually at least three. The large white, the small white, and the green-veined white. But that summer there was a glut of large white butterflies everywhere and their caterpillars were ubiquitous on every possible 
food plant that I could find. And so I decided that the first project of the new Jonathan Downs butterfly farm was to breed a cabbage white. It's more specifically to breed the large white. The fact that nobody would have wanted to buy them off me because they were everywhere to be seen that summer and their larvae were causing havoc in market gardens up and down the length and breadth of Merry England. I just decided I wanted to breed them. And so I went ahead and started collecting large numbers of these cabbage white caterpillars. But within days I was shocked to find that a large minority of them suddenly were covered with these little yellow pupa. What on earth could it be, I thought. It turned out that as well as there being a glut of the different cabbage white butterflies in North Devon that summer, there was also a glut of a parasitic wasp called Cotesia glomeratus, which is a well-known parasite of the white butterflies. Here we have some footage from Japan of the larvae of Cotesia glomeratus emerging from a parasitized and still alive caterpillar. It's not Pyrus brassica and in fact because the white butterflies in the Orient are really rather confusing I'm not even going to pretend that I know what species it is. But it does show the revolting way in which these creatures actually complete their life cycle. I'm not really a fan of wasps anyway, but the idea of something being able to go lay eggs on the skin of a caterpillar and then have its babies eat the poor caterpillar alive from the, from the inside out is particularly nasty as far as I'm concerned. And yes, you guessed it. The thing that Graham and I found on my garden gate at the beginning of the winter was no more than a, the dried out remains of where a caterpillar had once been and where now there were only the husk cases of the glomerata wasp that had parasitized it. But it's been rather an interesting story getting there, but we're not over yet. In the same article where I finally managed to get a picture of one of these cat parasitized caterpillars, they said that there is a new project going on in North America where they are intending to import the glomerata larvae from Europe and Britain and to release them into the North American biotope in order to keep various species of harmful caterpillar in their place. Well, haven't you ever learnt a bloody thing over the years? Don't you know what invariably happens when one tries to introduce a predator from one biotope into another biotope in order to keep down the numbers of some pest or other. Only a few weeks ago we were talking about the cane toad in Australia, but in the same book by L. Hugh Newman that I read and which set me off on this um, little rabbit hole in the first place, he told me how he had been involved in a project that was to release cinnabar moth caterpillars in New Zealand in order to keep down ragwort plants. What the bloody ragwort plants had been doing introduced to New Zealand in the first place, I don't know. But the idea of introducing a foreign predator which could do all sorts of horrible things to the native ecosystem is nothing short of madness. And I'm afraid, boys and girls, the American government 
who are sanctioning the project to introduce Cartesia glomerata to the North American biotopes are playing with fire. But sadly, as we've seen on the global stage in recent years, that is something which the American government seemed to like doing, playing with fire. The other day, Louis, the producer of this show and an old friend of mine, came down to visit us here at the CFZ and he had some disturbing news. John, I've just found a website. It says that the CFZ is a cult. Well, yes, Louis, that um, website's been around for a while. And I always thought it was ridiculous, but then I decided to look up and see what a cult actually is. Well, Louis... In modern English, cult is a term considered pejorative by some for a social group that is defined by its unusual religious, spiritual or philosophical beliefs and rituals, or its common interest in a particular personality, object or goal. This sense of the term is controversial and weakly defined, having divergent definitions both in popular culture and academia, and has also been an ongoing source of contention amongst scholars across several fields of study. Oh no, cringe. Well, I suppose that we might be described as a cult, really, because we do have unconventional views, and... If I'm going to be honest about it, the CFZ are not even conventional within the realms of cryptozoology. But I've always thought of us as a family. And if the CFZ is a family, then I'm Charlie. And now we go over to California for the second part of my interview with Bigfoot researcher Daniel Perez. So, what's next? What's next for me? Mm -hmm. Continue continue to work on the subject of Bigfoot in terms of actual field investigations. So, so I'm 59 now, and so soon I will be retired. And my objective is to start doing a little more field activities because you can't be a keyboard warrior behind a computer uh, and expect to find a Bigfoot. It simply will not happen. The other idea. It will never happen at a convention or a meeting giving a great talk. It has to be done in the field. And so it takes you back to the day of on the planet where there were great explorations, looking for things or not looking for things and accidentally finding them. And so that's it's, it's going to get down to field activities in terms of uh, solving the Bigfoot mystery. I've been at it for quite a bit. So anywhere in particular where anywhere, the reports are. Anywhere in I particular you want to go. It, it's it's like this. Firemen, yeah, firemen, firemen in general just don't go out looking for a fire. They get someone tells them there there's a fire in a certain location and they go there and almost a hundred percent of the time they find that fire. And so the best thing to do is just lay low until there's a report where you deem it's good enough to go investigate and that just hope that you get lucky in the area because even if you're in a certain geographical area, it doesn't mean that you're gonna have any luck in finding a Bigfoot because that area is generally wide open and it could go north, south, west or east and it's just like if there's all tree cover in the area, you could get lost quite easily. What percentage of the sightings that come in to you do you deem worthy of further research? Well, there's a lot of uh, Bigfooters who have certain numbers, and I don't know. And like I said in the 25th anniversary of the Bigfoot Times newsletter, I said my best answer to most questions out there is that I don't know. Because there's still cases out there that we think might be real, that might not be real. So to mm -hmm. say like you're putting a percentage of, of what reports are real and what reports are not, I can't, I can't give you a percentage. But I would suspect if that you have just a, an average citizen that's going about their daily business 
And say, for instance, they decide to take a, a trip up to Northern California in the woods on a sightseeing trip, on a camping trip and whatever, and something crosses the road in front of them at night and they report it. I don't really see any reason why they would be fabricating such a report that something large, tall, hairy, upright like a man ran across the road in front of their vehicle. I don't see what the motivation would be to fabricate or hoax such a report. No, you, you, you have to look where the money is. And if it's something that the person immediately gets paid from a newspaper or a TV company or thing from, I always get suspicious then when, when there's money involved. So how does your investigative process go? Say that you've received a call that um, some bloke called John, i.e. me, has been up in the woods and I've seen something running across the road in front of my car. What do you do? How, how does your investigative process function? Well, because I work full time, it gets down to when I have an opportunity to get out there and do the investigation. And say, for instance, you look back to 1996, I rented, rented, I bought a motorhome in 1996, and I went cross country with that motorhome to go find out things for myself, and also to take that motorhome to Atlanta, Georgia, to go see the Olympic Games. And so when I was in that part of the country, I made a decision to go up to Ohio and to go find out what was going on there from a Bigfoot perspective and to meet with my colleagues up there. And so one of the people that I had my eye on for quite a while was an eyewitness by the name of Patrick Pulling from West Mansfield, Ohio, who had a broad daylight sighting while he was on a tractor taking care of his farm field. And so I met with his neighbor because I didn't know Patrick Poling directly. And so this was, his sighting was in 1980 and I didn't get there until 1996. But by his own estimation, you know, he still stuck to his guns that this sighting did happen. So I was quite intrigued because there was some publicity about it in the newspapers. Back then, there was no internet. And so I got with his neighbor who just knew of him. And back there, when you live on a farm, it's not like you could walk right next door. Your, your farm neighbor might be a mile away. But we did have his phone number, and so we phoned him. And he spoke about it a little bit, and then the person that I had on the phone for me, who was the neighbor, I told him, uh, don't let him hang up, don't let him hang up, don't let him hang up. I said, I said, is there any possibility if we could come over to his house and talk to him on the kitchen table? And so reluctantly, he agreed. And so that same day, right after the telephone conversation, we went to his property, Patrick Pauling's. Uh, went into his house, sat down at the kitchen table, and he proceeded to tell us what had happened to him in 1980 in terms of having a sighting. And at the time, he really didn't know anything about Bigfoot. He just said he saw something that was large, hairy, right there on the tree line, where the tree line meets the farm field, walking. And he kind of expressed that it looked like a big gorilla type of thing and that it was broad daylight and he was on top of a tractor. He, I think he said something that he had his shotgun with him and I guess the shotgun was to shoot birds or whatever that were scare off birds from the farm field. And so he had seen something and so he took his tractor and tried to get closer to whatever it was he was looking at. And so he got a really good view of it and so I interviewed him many, many years after the fact. And even then, everything that he told me just sounded straight down the line. It sounded like he was being very truthful about everything. And again, it's just like you have to have that gut feeling as to what sounds right to you. Is it plausible? And this guy, again, was not even looking for any sort of publicity. 
when we were on the phone with him, just trying to get him to talk, he really didn't want to talk about it. And so it was with great reluctance that he spoke with me, but he did. And it was just, it was refreshing to hear his report because to this day, 2023, if I were to say, who are the best witnesses you ever spoke with? Patrick Poling would be one of them, in addition to Bob Gillen, who was with Roger Patterson. And we'll be back with Daniel in a week's time. And now, if you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And there's the ghost of Joe Strummer, who's an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, wants me to remind you, always press the notification bell, or else you won't be told when the next show's going to be. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to say a big thank you to all the people involved in this episode, including my producer Louis, Graham Inglis, who always looks after me and who recently has spent most of his time pushing me in a wheelchair round and round the labyrinthine corridors of North Devon District Hospital and Biddeford District Hospital. And a big thank you to all the ladies of the CFZ, Miss Maxine, Miss Karen and Miss Judy, Miss Guinevere, Miss Shelley, and I hope I haven't missed anybody out, but you're all in my thoughts and in my prayers constantly, my darlings. Thank you very much to my guest this week, who is Daniel Perez, who'll be back again next week. And that's about it. So, I'll be back on Wednesday. What am I going to be talking about on Wednesday? I've got absolutely no idea. But it might be about some weird ants that Richard Muirhead found. And I'll be back next Saturday. And what are we going to be doing on Saturday? Well, we'll have the final part of my interview with Daniel Perez and the first part of my interview with David Scott, the new head honcho of CFZ Canada. It's going to be a very good show, so don't make sure you don't miss it. Okay, are you there, Mr. McQuinnan? Because if you're there to watch it, I'm certainly going to be seeing you. <laughs>